Hi. Very good. So this notion of digital divide also is relevant to uh, cultural influences that I will be talking about and how they are uh, international uh, fashion is um, more Western dominant. Um, so. So yeah, international fashion, semiotics of hybrid identities in design. Um, I've analyzed non-Western designers uh, looking at the cultural influences um, and identities negotiating between their um, designers, between their own culture and international Western-centric um, influences. Um, well, Western fashion is not the only fashion system. However, it dominates uh, international fashion trends and um, influence non-Western markets. And um, I guess we can all witness that through um, all sorts of fashion weeks in emerging uh, fashion cities. Um, I suggest that cultural inferences are understood at the level of hybridity. Um, because I found the model of uh, hybrid identities useful to look um, at uh, non-Western designers um, and how these um, um, how they negotiate um, cultural belonging within international space. Uh, one of the most uh, one of the important global trends in emerging fashion cities is that established Western brands are expanding their presence in emerging markets um, because there is fast-growing customer base there and who are able to afford those brands and desire Western fashions. So non-Western emerging designers are competing with those Western brands not only abroad, um, but also in their local markets facing international competition locally. So this dynamic dictates new demands for local designers to negotiate their, their cultural identities and redefine local modern cultures. Uh, so the study focuses on, uh, on cultural meanings of hybrid identities from the perspective of international Western-centric cultural influences on local non-Western fashion designers. Um, and I found that fashion design is a meaningful resource uh, to study these uh, this dynamics because it's visual and um, language barrier free. A second slide, please. Oh. Uh, so my visual se social semiotic approach requires conceptual parameters, and for this purpose I chose uh, Pietrus and Papastrogiadis models um, of distinguishing cultural differences and hybrid cultural forms. So the, the both, uh, they both define three groups of culturally hybrid identities. What I mean by hybrid is a mix between foreign and local cultural elements. Uh, hybridization in the study refers not only to a broad cultural divide between Western and non-Western, but also between traditional and modern, territorial and cosmopolitan cultural forms. Uh, Pietrus discusses hybridity as globalization and cultural melange that is the catalyst um, of cultural diversity. He distinguishes three ways of seeing cultural differences. Differentialism, when local traditional culture is differentiated by incorporating foreign influences. Uh, convergence um, as cultural homogenization and modernization, and hybridization as cultural mixing, transcultural po postmodern views. Uh, Papastergiadis talks about hybridity as cosmopolitanism or a third space and contends that hybridity serves as a space for recognizing innovation and new cultural forms. He proposes three uh, interrelated levels of hybridity. Visible, visible manifestation of foreign elements integrated with own culture. Um, cultural differences are neutralized and naturalized with the host culture. Uh, in this case, I'm talking of international culture, uh, which I refer to as Western dominant culture. Uh, and the new cultural forms emerging from hybrid identities and mixed cultural origins. Um, uh, both scholars acknowledge the shift in traditional framework of cultural identity and discuss cosmopolitan identity. They suggest that cosmopolitanism is not void of culture, but rather is enriched by combining multiple cultures to create new meanings and share those cultural values with the global community. Um, and finally, in this study, I suggest that hybridization is not a chaotic mix of cultural influences, but a production of identifiable cultural forms. 
Um, and to illustrate um, these three groups, um, this is the first group that I was um, um, referring to, uh, how it's um, um, manifest in fashion designs. So I chose these two collections of uh, Indian designers, emerging Indian designers, to uh, describe cultural mixing as incorporating some international influences, but drawing on the local traditional cultural elements. Uh, so most apparent visual detail um, you see is the tribal and ethnic elements. Uh, adherence to cultural roots is the distinction of this category. However, we also observe, observe modern elements that belong to Western uh, cultural milieu. Asak as in May mixes tribal prints, uh, print details with modern mini tailored looks, for instance, um, and the printed shawl also references some of the um, ethnic elements. Kavita Sharma uses colorful applique details that are reminiscent of cultural origins as well. Um, such as um, long skirt draped, um, reminiscent of a sari, for instance. Um, so these designs display a strong connection to designers' cultural roots, yet are modernized by incorporating Western influences. Um, uh, this slide shows um, foreign designers showing in Paris. So I, t I chose two groups, so the designers that show in their own cities and, and designers, non-Western designers that show showed in Paris, and for comparison, you can see also the, um, uh, sim similarly uh, to the designers previously, they display cultural heritage in the designs, yet remain modern and, and trendy and appeal not only to local taste, but to international audience. Um, so the second group, uh, you can see um, apparent uh, difference. Um, in identity there. Uh, it supposes neutralizing cultural differences and naturalizing with the host culture, in this case, Western culture, referencing one's own cultural elements as a sign of distinction. In Pietro's model, this category is referred to as cultural convergence, producing global cultural homogeneity. Uh, these collections exhibit um, limited signs of hybridity, but more of an interpretation of international style sense. This group often includes those designers who travel to the Western capitals not only to gain recognition internationally, but also to gain popularity in their home markets. Uh, international success is very important for local popularity. Uh, the Studio K, uh, K designs, uh, let's, um, you can see there, uh, classic with uh, some relaxed elegance. Um, and Lee's designs are more structured, but similarly show classic style elements with some um, original details and styling. Uh, even when cultural elements are not highlighted in the designs, they still have endless possibilities to express originality and novelty. And uh, the similarly, uh, foreign two foreign designers that showing in Paris um, illustrate uh, culturally neutralized designs. Uh, it can be described classic with a twist, I would say. And novelty is expressed through the use of cutting and draping techniques, for instance, rather than uh, using play on traditional cultural themes. Um, the third group manifests new cultural forms that are not specific or char characteristic to a territorial culture, but are translocal and cosmopolitan. Uh, the third group is distinctly different from the second as it seeks the opposite effect from blending in. This group is distinguished by originality, standing out, and making a statement. The designs belonging to the, uh, this group are most visually stimulating, dramatic, and original. Uh, both uh, Kal i Suktai and Levi collections illustrate these qualities, although they are distinctly different. Each collection in this category is original and distinct. That is the main characteristic of this category. Individuality is achieved through the use of not only the design techniques, but also by incorporating cultural influences and transforming them into new cultural forms that are transcultural and cosmopolitan. Um, and so for comparison, also the two designers that showed in Paris, um, you could see the same qualities. Uh, in my view, these designers become the pioneers and trendsetters due to their experimental and daring approach, 
and early Japanese designers used precisely this quality to break into the Western, um, uh, Western fashion um, in early 1990s. Uh, so this cultural space is beyond cultural hybridization, but it's translocal, cosmopolitan, and open to cultural transformation. And um, to summarize uh, this, um, um, I've, so the, this analysis shows that each collection is hybrid, however, the incorporation and mixing of cultural influences are different and can be identified with three visibly distinct groups of hybrid cultural identities. Although I present three categories, um, uh, the distinctions are fluid and may overlap. The fluidity between the three groups exists mainly because hybrid identities are negotiable. The function of this analysis was to highlight the main characteristics of these three groups. Um, so this inquiry uncovers different aspects of cultural self, uh, drawing from ethnic heritage to neutralizing cultural differences and um, the emergence of new transcultural forms that belong to cosmopolitan culture. Hybridity in this respect plays a dominant role, especially in fostering cultural diversity. And hybridity is also an essential catalyst of originality, creative force, and innovation in design. Um, I think that this analysis is useful for understanding cultural belonging in the international environment and specifically helping fashion brands to manage their design direction and brand identity. In, in, in kind of international space. Thank you. Thanks, Alana. And again, plenty of time for a couple of questions. Anyone like to start us off? I think the idea of the kind of clash of the cultures in or a clash of continents in a garment's really interesting or collection. Mm -hmm. I just wonder to what extent you'd be able to uh, have a similar analysis of specific um, cultures within the, the Western category. So I'm thinking in terms of, say, uh, menswear or suits, you have like an English cut and an mm -hmm. Italian cut and things like that, mm -hmm. and whether that would do you think going down to that level mm -hmm. that there is still this, I mean, is it older? Is it? Do you think there is still that hybridity that you um, could Well, I that? think the hybridity can be observed everywhere because, you know, cultural purity, I, I don't think, you know, it exists. And yes, historically uh, with, um, uh, you know, British especially, let's say, they guarded cultural purity and et cetera, but it's, it's never really uh, um, an existing phenomenon. I think the hybridity is always um, present. Um, it's just I was I, w I just wanted to look at the current trends in in all this kind of globalization and cultural, um, you know, influences what's happening and especially with emergence of uh, non-Western markets uh, because I think uh, they are very interesting, very dynamic, and and we're not sure how to how to look, place them, how to look at them, and uh, and also these non-Western designers. I define like define they redefining their own cultures, really modernizing, redefining based on on Western uh, on how they integrate into the whole international uh, family because it's um, I don't think they well from my perspective they not integrating with or let's let me learn how the Western world functions and compete with them. I think they are coming up with some uh, maybe new cultural forms as well. So so I think that's. Okay, thanks again. There'll be, again, time for questions afterwards if anyone thinks of anything. So thanks for learning. It. So our next speaker is uh, Charlotte Bic Bandlian from the, National, the Oslo National Academy of the Arts, and she's speaking about reconstructing the Nordics. So I think it should be a very nice segue from Ilona's paper. So first of all, thank you for the invitation to come and give this presentation. And I'm sorry to see that we brought the Nor Nordic weather with us. <laughs> um, my name is Charlotte Big Bandlian, Assistant Professor at Kio Design, Oslo National Academy of the Arts. Um, I'm trained as an anthropologist with a research interest in material culture. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, reconstructing the Nordic, I mean, the timing couldn't be better. Uh, with The Economist putting the region on their front cover, I think this was last week. And also London Fashion Week is hosting a grand exhibition on Scandinavian fashion next week, opening on Friday. So the photos here will just roll in the back and I will not comment on each and every one of them, but we'll see how it goes. Um, yesterday I visited Snöhata Architects here in New York, which is a Norwegian and American company. And I spoke with their director and senior partner, Craig, Craig Dykers, and he said, oh, you're invited to speak about the Nordic again. <laughs> and um, self-obsessing in the Nordic condition is taking place in several fields, fields these days, not just within the Department of Fashion, but also in architecture with a big building boom. That's the harbor area of Oslo. Um, so the theme is heritage and identity in fashion. How does heritage, tradition, nostalgia empower and how does it hinder? Well, in a Norwegian context, heritage and tradition has been synonymous with being backwards. And in a Nordic uh, design context, Norwegian design has been the underdog. And within the realm of fashion design, we've been characterized basically by everything that we are not, compared to Sweden's Acne or H&M or Copenhagen Fashion Week. But something is changing and the, the perceptions are changing and the link between scarcity and exclusivity is getting more visible. So the potential in the anti-established. Um, the Norwegian condition has indeed fostered unique cultural expressions uh, and our most famous cultural export has, in fact, been black metal. For those of you who don't know it, this is, it's a music genre linked to Satanism and burning down thousand-year-old churches from the UNESCO list of world heritage. I think I have a photo of that coming up. Okay. Um, yeah. The concept... Oh! Small game, find the Norwegian, quick, quick, quick. Yes, it's the foreign minister in the yellow suit. <laughs> in the back there. More on that later. Okay, the concept Scandinavian design became world famous within the sphere of furniture design in the 50s. And the Nordic being characterized by the blonde wood materials and minimalist aesthetics. Stereotypes that has since then been challenged, for example, in a Berg publication from last year called Scandinavian Design Alternative Histories, which is edited by a Norwegian art historian called Tjetil Fallon, based at the University of Oslo. However, um, the Norwegian contribution to this perceived golden era has been somewhat subordinate to the iconic Danish names, for instance, and it was in fact not until last month, that is January 2013, that a comprehensive context was organized for the Norwegian contributions to the era for the first time. Uh, an exhibition called Norwegian Icons, there it is, uh, actually making it possible for the first time to actually start to identify a distinct Norwegian aesthetic by simply by just seeing the design collected under one roof. And this exhibition will also travel to Tokyo, as you can see, later this spring and then here in New York, I think in October. Um, yeah, October. Uh, yeah, that's the black metal there. Okay, so as educators of designers within an art school context, we are trying to channel or bring awareness to the unique aspects that form or shape the Norwegian condition. So the, the potential in the sort of unconscious framework from the margins for fostering interesting design. And it may seem that it's not until quite recent that the men this mentality has indeed changed. So it took a while for us to get cosmopolitan enough to be able to see the unique and hence exotic in our own culture. And the value of made in Norway in this context is reflecting a quite recent reconstruction of national identity. It's timing reflecting us finally being international enough to exoticize our own cultural specifics. This is our school. 
Um, okay, so the welfare system is what is usually associated with the Nordic countries. And the question should be, how are the welfare ideals manifested in present day fashion? Or is it possible to point to tendencies in Norwegian fashion that reflect the distinctive Nordic sense of community? Well, one of its consequences is a unique safety. I mean, a condition found uh, very few places these days. And this condition one should expect to be fostering very high risk taking potential. But this has not been the case, and we wonder why. <coughs> I mean, Norway still remains rather untouched by the world's economic crisis. So we'll see what's happened about that. Okay, and secondly, the rough climate and outdoor hiking culture makes it necessary to dress functional, such as, for instance, the guys from a brand called Norwegian Rain making raincoats into streetwear for an international audience. And the gender equality with both maternity and paternity leave has produced a rather androgynous Norwegian look. And last but not least, a non-existent aristocratic heritage is resulting in a certain inherent blindness towards rules and communal fall, as you saw with the yellow suit. Um, yes, that's research on wool. Let's get to that. Um, so. We don't have a tradition for high fashion. What we do have is a tradition for wool and knitting. And the fashion department has been involved in a research project called Valuing Norwegian Wool, which was led by the National Institute for Consumer Research. And project partners included representatives from the entire value chain, from agricultural organizations, industry and commerce, to design and marketing. And the goal was to look at the whole life cycle of wool, finding new and innovative approaches to bringing wool to the forefront in textiles again. This is some students' work, and I was supposed to actually bring this hood for you to see, but it's back at the hotel because I thought I was coming tomorrow. Okay. So um, Norwegian wool has a strong cultural impact. For example, the Norwegian traditional dress is made from it. That is not that. That is the design of Patlik and Selvig using traditional wool techniques. Um, wool made it possible for the Vikings to even get here uh, because this, their sails were made from it. And actually that's one um, hidden and forgotten technology that is now being researched and they're trying to figure out how they even did that. And this um, material sensibility or awareness is also quite uncommonly widespread in Norway. We Norwegians know we must put, we must put pure wool next to our skin to even survive. And um, it's maintained by a vital handicraft and <coughs> quite living and broad knitting tradition in the population. I mean, Norwe Norwegians actually know how to knit. Um, blah, 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 Norwegian sweater, yeah. Because you do have your own perception of the Norwegian sweater because I researched um, the concept and I saw it first appearing in the LL Beans catalog from 1965. <laughs> Uh, and that it was out of production for a while because it, it became hugely unpopular when it was produced in China and then they started to produce it again, produce it again in uh, 2009, I think. Yeah, it's a bit like the Pringle story from Scotland. Yeah. Uh, and I also must add that it's, it's not particularly Norwegian, it's more like an Icelandic fisherman's sweater, but anyways, okay. <laughs> This is uh, uh, the fashion designer Pierce Book, who did a sort of decontextualization of Norwegian traditional materials, uh, making it appear within couture. Um, he had his own fashion house, opened in Paris in 1977, and lasted until 1995. So that's one example. And <coughs> more recently, we have a duo called Arne and Carlos, coming up after those. Uh, who did the traditional Marius sweater with a twist. So instead of using the traditional pattern, they integrated the Space Invader aesthetics. And that was picked, on, um, picked up by Comme de Garceau and produced in collaboration with them. It will, it, it will emerge after Sonia Wanda there. Okay. Uh, there they are, cuties. 
<laughs> okay. So um, now I want to talk a bit about art versus commerce. Five minutes, okay. So um, uh, Oslo Fashion Week opened this Monday and all the runways were closed and instead the Fashion Week had moved into the new Museum of Modern Art, uh, Ostrup Farnley, which is built by the famous Renzo Piano in the center of Oslo. And this is a sign of not just, I think, trend sensibility among the organizers reflecting the sort of art and fashion bonanza of recent reoccurrence, but also how the artistic approach may be a positioning angle for the Norwegian design within the Nordic context. And uh, the week before that, a new and almost parallel um, alternative fashion week called Up uh, was organized as an independent showcase and they chose to uh, show their stuff at the Young Artists Society. And there has been a lot of initiatives in that department. Uh, two years ago, uh, independent actors cooperated on an exhibition called A Pop-Up Book. The flyer will be on soon. Uh, a concept birthed in Milan during Fashion Week the previous September, where a group of uh, emerging artists and designers came together to sort of introduce themselves to the world. There's the invitation. And the curator called Alexander Helle, who is also creative director of the uh, before I mentioned Norwegian rain, he created an environment inspired by the Norwegian word dugnad, which loosely translates to a group of people getting together to work towards a common goal that benefits the community. And before that, there has also been Nordic, various Nordic initiatives such as something called Ö Ö, Was It a Dream? Which was a Nordic con uh, constellation and it's been running for three years now. Okay. Um, so we also see that a lot of the actual fashion work is either done or at least initiated within the art context. And an example is Franz Schmidt, this is not Franz Schmidt, <laughs> who is conducting artistic research here uh, at the National Academy. And if you saw some fabric samples, that, that was his work. Uh, he discovered uh, samples of exquisite multicolored woven fabrics previously made at the factory Schellingstad Wool and Mills in southern Norway, a place that was, that's now actually turned into a museum. And he dedicated two years of his life to reconstruct <coughs> them. And unfortunately, it has been a lot of interest, but no real action except for Fendi, who has already started producing their stuff there. Um, this is a waffle, Norwegian waffle, formed as a traktor. What's the word in English? I don't know. Tractor, tractor. okay. Uh, it's merged from, uh, from the highly successful group, no uh, Moods of Norway. They are clever marketing people with their own flagship store in LA and things. Okay. Um, the current tendencies uh, are, of course, also found in other places tangent to the field of fashion, and I want to mention a magazine called Smug, or Smug. It's a biannual independent fashion and art magazine founded in Oslo, Norway, uh, covering art, fashion, and culture. And the base, basic premise behind Smug is that in a time where websites uh, and blogs are delivering news minute by minute. They want to slow things down, blah, blah, blah. Skipping a bit of this. Um, it's a really interesting magazine, and um, they claim that in the belief that a present day magazine should be an object you desire and will want to hold, up, will want to hold on to for years, Smug pays special attention to the physical presentation of the magazine, the paper and print quality is considered a part of the message. So this reorientation towards the materiality is also seen there. This is a new uh, initiative called Hike, another distinct Norwegian concept, a way of traveling. Um, it's, a, it's a project created by the designer Siv Stördal, Ida Falk Eyen, and Harald Lunde Helgesen. And they're based respectively in Norway, LA, and London. And they have also initiated a collaboration with the producers of um, 
this is just an interim, uh, with the producers of the original penny loafer. I mean, it's, it's, a, bold, it's a bold claim, but Aureland School, uh, meaning the shoe from Aureland, a municipality in the county of Sognofjorden in Norway. Um, yeah, is, is, a, is an interesting example of uh, revitalization of quirky heritage, decontextualization and success based on different aspects, merging the loafer trend, the fetishization of the local, revitalization of handicraft tradition, authenticity and availability because they will be available via opening ceremony <coughs> later this year. Am I out of time? Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Can I, can I just say one short important thing? Because I was supposed to invite all of you to Oslo this fall because we are um, hosting our own fashion colloquium. More info on that now that we have the all, all, all the contact info. But October after the fashion weeks. Thanks. I was going to um, say um, Thanks to Charlotte for bringing Norway to us, but thank you even more for inviting us to Norway. Any questions? <laughs> Please. Yes. Thanks. Uh, you, you've um, given us a very interesting insight into Norwegian uh, aspect of Nordic, but to what extent does it make sense to talk about Nordic fashion, uh, could, does that embrace Norway, Sweden, Finland and Denmark? Is it possible to say that there's a Nordic style mm. or is it now really exploded? And, and what really you've shown us today is um, a style that might be associated with Oslo. Yeah. Is, it a sense of, is there a sense of uh, the fashion city and the rest of the country is busy knitting away doing what is always done? Right, right. Um, uh, well, yes, uh, that, that was several questions. I know that uh, the Nordic countries has now decided to to really <coughs> collaborate and and push the the common Nordic context. They're talking about doing all the fashion weeks in Copenhagen in cooperation and blah blah blah. Uh, these are this is actually an, one of our students. Um, just need to mention that. Um, yes, sen uh, sort of center and periphery. I mean, Norway is really known for having a sort of rural, ruralistic uh, approach. I mean, keeping, keeping the whole of the country alive. And we see that also in fashion. I mean, although the fashion <coughs> week is in Oslo, the examples I showed you about the Aureland school and, and, and the Schellingstad woolen mills and, and things is that you're actually uh, getting these collaborations with local uh, handicraft traditions and small scale industrial production, etc which really combines sort of uh, Oslo with the rest of the country. I think the Norwegians are different though. They are innately competitive. I'm reading George F. Kennan, our greatest uh, diplomat's biography, married a Norwegian woman. So he lived to be 103, she lived to be 101. <laughs> because you're not going to get away with uh, But I also mean that in the sense of Amundsen. You had his picture up there first. And uh, the Master Builder and Hedda Gabel, all those plays are com very competitive. So I think that competition is a part of fashion in a certain sense. So I think maybe perhaps you'll agree or you won't agree. You have a kind of an inside track to the nature of, of what the fashion world is. There is a competitive edge there where I don't see that with the Danes, with the Swedes, with the Finns. It's... it's or with the Iceland, it's, it's not a, the same issue. Maybe you agree, maybe you don't. I have to think about that, but it certainly is a very interesting perspective, and there is something about this, at least explorative nature of Norwegians, sort of a bit conquering attitude that, yeah, really resonates, absolutely. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, I'm gonna say thank you to Charlotte just because of time, that was um, lots of opportunity for more conversation later, I think. So um, the final presentation, and again, you know, thanks to the speakers for keeping so well to time, is by Carolyn Mayer and Ian King from the LCF, which seems an appropriate way to tie this, um, uh, the, the worldview up, or whatever we call it, and their paper is Clothing Cultures.
unlike uh, most of the presentation today, this is about um, uh, research which is being developed rather than research which is actually taking place. And it's, it's I suppose, uh, an introduction to uh, the colloquial series, really, which is more about collaboration. So I'll let me ex elaborate slightly. We, uh, we are here, really, to invite people to join us as partners on a research project, a research project which is taking some ideas that are already going around and moving it forward, moving it into kind of areas that kind of develops this notion of significance and meaning. What does it mean? What potential can we, in fact, use in terms of fashion and clothing? So we want to use fashion and clothing in terms of narrative, which Kate Fletcher and her project has been doing, but then develop it in terms of, of networks and talk about how those networks inform both our understanding but also create other viral possibilities. So that's what we're going to talk about when this machine kicks off. I should say this is not the presentation we were going to bring because we had a nice pretty pictures and things like that. So this is a kind of um, an old version which mostly is text and other stuff like that. And you know. So um, it's going to be a surprise to me what slide comes up because I have absolutely no idea what the first one is. But it should be fun. There was a quote with, from David, what's his name? Stewart. What's the quote, who is he? The Prime Minister of England. Um, Cameron. Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know that means the fact I can't remember the Prime Minister's name, but probably because he's an, but what I was interested in his, his he, he talks about, a, he did a speech in London a couple of weeks ago, and he said um, the real problem with the, the European Union was this, uh, was this, in, this intense understanding of, of, of the relationships between states. And he said, what we really have missed in the EU is, in fact, it's not about states, it's about relationships between people. And I kind of thought that was really interesting, and that really started where this, this uh, presentation was going to go. But it's never going to start, ever. <laughs> Sorry. The pretty version's at the hotel, and it's probably, it's actually on the side, Aww. just by the lamp. <laughs> and it's kind of there. It could have been like. Right timing. Oh, yeah. Right. Okay. But you see, that's it. Well, anyway. But the idea is about narratives and things like that and, <coughs> and viral networks and things like that. And really, it's about calling for people who are interested in the potential of research and about coming together and saying, okay what could I contribute, or what could we contribute, to this form of understanding? Sorry? Should I say my bit? Sorry? Should I say my bit? You yeah. Carol, go. Okay, so the other, the other thing that we're really interested in, um, in addition to collecting more information on narratives about clothing, which we have a lot of at the moment, um, we want to take it further, we want to go beyond the narratives, and to understand whether um, the global pattern of these narratives of items of clothing follows a phenomenon called small world networks, which you m might have heard of. Um, and it's a, it's a pattern of networks which is reproduced in nature and in synthetic networks. Ah, oh, it's coming? No? Um, and it's been around, the concept has been around since the 1990s. Um, mainly driven from the um, Sant Santa Fe University for the Center of Complexity. And the researchers there have looked at it in terms of uh, fetal brain development, in terms of the American National Grid, for example, follows these patterns of connectivity. And it's about certain hubs of, oh, amazing. Thank you. <laughs> so it has. <laughs> I'll just, I'll just say this bit and then you can go on. So it's about the hubs of connectivity. So we're really interested to find out whether fashion follows these same patterns of connectivity as so many other um, natural and synthetic networks that are reproduced over and over and over again. Um, I'm sure you've heard of the Kevin Bacon phenomenon. <laughs> it's, 
But it's that phenomenon and it's that that's reproduced. Um, also the six degrees of separation, which was a, a study in psychology from the 1960s where um, a person was given a, a package to um, send to somebody else and it, it was recorded along the way. And the, to get to a person who they absolutely didn't know, but the mean was less than six people. And um, the, the researcher at the time concluded that we're no more than six degrees of separation from anybody in the world. And he was quite ahead of the game, actually, in doing this. And as I say, in the 1990s, uh, researchers at Santa Fe um, came up with a mathematical um, formula for this small world network. And that's something that I'm really interested in. Oh, sorry. Is that better? Yeah, OK. All right. OK, so um, what I'm interested in is looking at whether fashion follows the same small world network as we've seen in so many other disciplines. And I think that would be really, really interesting. So um, I'm going to let Ian now do the pitch for getting partners <laughs> for this to collect the narratives. Um, and then perhaps we, we can answer some questions at the end. Thanks. OK. What have I got to do? <coughs> OK, I've got to talk. Right, I'm going to talk about things. How do you, do you press this? Oh, good. So that was the David Cameron bit, which is OK. <laughs> And this is um, connectivity. Do we need to go through all these slides? That's yeah? pretty much what I've just said. OK, then we don't need to do that. OK, and that's what you've done. And we've done this. This is going to be really good. Um, <laughs> it's very professional. I think we should go back a bit. This is good. When you have a woman on the team, you know. Okay. This, is, this is where the small world networks have been found to um, exist. I think it's fascinating. And even when. You know, and you wouldn't expect it to find um, these systems are in, you know, I'd say the, the American electricity, the power grids, for example, in biological systems, in fetal brain development, um, in social networks, in Facebook connections, and so on. I think it would be truly amazing to find that actually happens with fashion as well around the, around the world. And to put it in a context which would allow us then to predict where the networks will develop and how they'll develop and to also understand any loose and weak connections because the, the small world networks exist with very strong um, local connections and very weak distinct collection, uh, connections and it's the, the weak distinct collect connections which are really important obviously because if they are broken then the, the links between the important hubs disappear. So having this knowledge would enable us to, to strengthen any weak connections and, and build on the the strong local connections. So. Okay. Okay, so this is, we wanted to kind of use clothing as the basis of this because it's this kind of notion of how narratives are used and we wanted to explore these narratives in different ways, in ways that kind of um, are almost collapse some of the defensive routines that people often employ in these circumstances. So this is why we're kind of interested. So what we need, and this is where the pitch that Karen has asked me to put through, is to talk about partners to join with us in creating and promoting this kind of relationships, and this kind of research. Because I think what we're interested in, this goes back to the, the, the whole rationale for the colloquial series, is this notion of cooperation and collaboration and how we might share resources at different parts of the world. The real problem with lots of research across the world is its expense. And a lot of this can actually be reduced by actually collaboration and cooperation. So what we're trying to do is call, call for different partners to join us in this research project and to become part of a team that can share in the process of, of the creation, but also in terms of the analysis and then, then draw out meaning from that. So that's what we're trying to do. So these are the kind of questions that we're asked and, uh, and these are the kind of outcomes that we're also trying to, uh, to talk about. We're also going to develop a, a, an exhibition from it. We're trying to draw all these different kind of extension and insights and then make an exhibition from that. Yeah. All right, okay, what we're looking for is people who are interested in these kind of areas mm -hmm. and who can see, I mean, th who can see the potential of what we're trying to achieve. They don't necessarily have to have the technical know-how, but they, we're, what we're really looking for is people who can bring different sets of skills and different forms of abilities to come together mm -hmm. and work in a kind of collection, a collective. Mm -hmm. 
we're looking for people who are collecting information. We're looking for people who are interested in images. We're looking for people who are interested in analyzing those images. We're making, look, looking for people who are actually interested in making sense of what those images mean and what the analysis of those images mean. So these kind of layers of what we're looking at. Then what we want to do is then share the information so that, so that people can get access to this. And we also want to see the significance of that and the meaning of that across different communities. You know, is there consistency, is there an inconsistency? And it goes on. Hi, Tony. No, it was, it was a um, question. <laughs> no, it was very enjoyable. Um, I had a question about small world networks. Could you say a little bit more about what distinguishes a small world network from a big world network or any other sort of network? I mean, I've got some ideas about it, but why, why should we particularly be looking at this? Well, because it's, because it's reproduced so much in nature and in synthetic systems. Um, it's interesting because it's it's random but organized random at the same so it's not just purely random connections but there is some randomness built in it's based on um different mathematical theories um which and i won't go into now but they there are patterns and if anybody wants me to send them the watson strogatz paper where the small world networks were defined in the first place in 98 i'd be very happy to do that it's really interesting. It's just a two-page letter to nature. Um, so if anybody wants to email me for that, I'd be very happy to send it on. Um, and there's been a lot of work since then. But it, it's to do with um, uh, edges and vectors. Um, it, uh, so it's a mathematical formula. But it's not just any old network. And it's a, it will enable, because the patterns are predictable, although they're random, they have a degree of predictability. Um, and it's the predictability that's really interesting in this because um, by understanding that it's not purely random and it's also not, not purely organized either, um, that in terms of economics, for example, it may be possible to predict um, a weaker system that has a very small network, a small local network, so I have to do it like this because this is how it is in my head. <laughs> so here's, here's the well-connected local network and it has some long distance um, weak connections to other local networks. And it's those weak connections that are hugely important because they make the connections in space. But also because they are so important, um, if they're broken, then it, 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 you know, it destroys the connectivity. But because they're distant, they're weak as well. And so by being able to identify the weaknesses, um, we should be able to predict and help establish a, you know, a, a stronger network, if you like, or, or build in redundancy to have other connections that support, in kind, in kind of a scaffold way, if you like, support an existing weak network. What Karen had just said shouldn't put you off, OK? Because it's... <laughs> What we're looking for with partners is not necessarily more Carolyn's. That's the last thing we want. What we want is people who can add different skills in a complementary way rather than a duplicating way. <laughs>